Good afternoon, everyone. Give me a thumbs up there, Andrew, if you can hear me so we know we're okay. Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for what I think will prove to be a very interesting session. Um, this is a webinar put on by the Committee on uh, Geological and Geotechnical Engineering, which is a part of the National uh, Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine Board of Earth Sciences and Resources. It's a very active committee looking for ways to uh, help define uh, challenges for us in the geotechnical arena. And uh, it was a committee that was established to be the focal point within the academies uh, for technical and public policy issues related to earth processes and materials, soil and rock mechanics, and the mitigation of natural and human hazards, um, along with responsible human development in these subject areas. So as we go through this, if you have questions, write them down. There is an opportunity uh, for you to enter them on a question entry point um, down, I think it's at the bottom of the screen. And we will screen through those and time permitting, we will ask as many of those questions as we can. We usually have more than we can get to, so we apologize if if uh, we don't get to your question, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Um, this webinar will be promoted, uh, posted on YouTube. An announcement will be sent to all of you who are attending today uh, as to when you can uh, see that and where to get to it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Samantha Messino, uh, Alini uh, Georges, and uh, Eric Edkin, who are the folks that uh, at uh, the, the uh, National Research Council who help us with all this and do a great job of organizing and producing these webinars. Um, Professor uh, Pedro Arduino from the University of Washington is another COGI member and he is going to field our questions today. Um, this is a challenging job because we get many questions and trying to organize them in a way that uh, we, we keep flow is good. Pedro does a great job of that. Again, you can submit your questions anytime um, and he will try to get to them as, we, as time permits. I do have to read a disclaimer here that's required by the Academy that any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by Dr. Whittle or anyone else during this webinar are those of those individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, or Medicine. They're very, very careful about not getting involved in, in uh, controversial issues. So with all that, uh, I'd like, it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Whittle whom I've known for quite a few years. He's Edmund K. Turner Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. He's known as an expert in geotechnical engineering uh, where his research deals principally with constitutive models of complex mechanical properties of soils and their application to predicting the performance of foundations and underground construction projects. His research has been widely used in the design of foundation systems for such uh, facilities as deep water, oil production, major urban excavation and tunneling projects, and, and other similar endeavors. Most recently, he led research efforts in the application of wireless sensor networks for monitoring underground water distribution systems and construction projects. He's a licensed professional engineer uh, and a very active consultant in many uh, major projects. He earned his BS degree from, uh, from uh, Imperial College in 1981 his doctor of science degree in geotechnical engineering from MIT in 1987. He's published more than 240 papers uh, and received several awards for his work from the AFCE. And uh, in, 19, or in 2010, Dr. Whittle was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, which is a very prestigious honor, well-deserved. Um, Professor Whittle, uh, please proceed with your presentation, which is called uh, Responding to Climate Change Through Geotechnical Engineering Research. Thank you, Alan, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon with you. Um, I'd like to begin by just thanking the, the committee, this Geological and Geotechnical Engineering Committee of National Academies for the kind invitation for, for me to present to you today. They gave me this challenge. They said, how should geotechnical engineering research respond to climate change, the challenges of climate change? As you can imagine, this is a huge topic to cover in a relatively short session today. Um, I should say I've given quite a lot of thought to the future of geotechnical engineering research in particular, um, and will reference a paper um, that was co-authored with Patricia Culligan and Jim Mitchell, and I think is on the link for the advert for this webinar. So a lot of the stuff on the actual scope of geotechnical engineering research is in that area. 
But what you're going to hear about today involves a sort of fresh perspective on where climate change fits relative to this. I thought I would begin with some, some key definitions. Um, the first thing to appreciate is what is climate change? And climate change is caused by the production of greenhouse gases, the trapping of heat in the atmosphere. And that's generated, the, the increase in the greenhouse gases is generated principally by human activities. I think you're all aware that the, over the last five years, we've had some of the hottest years in recorded human history. Crutzen and Sturmer in 2000 coined the term Anthropocene Epoch. And I think it's kind of appropriate for a committee on geological and geotechnical engineering to start by acknowledging the term. It essentially says that humans control an awful lot of the environment of the planet at the moment, and probably since the starting of uh, the industrial era. There are some other terminology from climate change we really need to understand before we embark on this. The first thing is that mitigation in the context of climate change refers to a general strategy to control global temperatures through reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. It's as simple as that. That is the main purpose of mitigation. Um, on contrast, adaptation. Adaptation refers to all the many, many policies and actions to reduce vulnerability and impacts on human populations at all scales, from the very local to the very global. So adaptation is a much more um, complex, myriad set of tasks, I would say. There are other terms that have been used in the context of climate change, and it's worth just mentioning them in passing, although I'm going to say little about them. Sustainability is a term introduced in 1987 by the Brundtland Commission, which talks about meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. In preparing this talk, I found it really interesting because in 1987, I was finishing my PhD thesis. And at that time, people were really concerned about running out of fossil fuels. That was our principal concern. Here we are 30 years later, and our principal concern is somehow weaning ourselves off fossil fuels to other sources to control greenhouse gases. It's funny how the world turns. The other word you're gonna hear a lot about, I think, is resilience. Resilience generally refers to the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to sources of stress on systems. That's what it means very broadly. In most engineering contexts, it refers to ensuring delivery of essential services. You may spare a thought in this pandemic for our colleagues in transit agencies who have discovered themselves in a rather unusual position that suddenly there is no demand for public transportation and therefore there are no revenue streams for all of the activities they need to run their systems. So in fact, there are many people going through resilience testing right now as we speak. So let's think about mitigation. If you start on the mitigation topic, you realize you have to understand something about the balance of carbon or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You'll see there's a unit conversion down the bottom of this figure. The message I'm trying to give in this figure is there is a net atmospheric growth of carbon or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through our activity, through our industrial activity, through our changes in land uses. Of course, some of the generation is, is handled by a sink in the terrestrial biosphere and a lot more of an uncertain amount perhaps going into the oceans where we may actually be acidifying the oceans very slowly. This of course doesn't tell us what's gonna happen in the future. What's gonna happen in the future depends very much the way the economy grows and the way we continue to produce greenhouse gases. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change views this by talking about how we control CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. And you can see on this figure on the right that there are what are called representative concentration pathways. And you'll see these in some of the future figures. 8.5, essentially is referred to as business as usual or a growth prospectus as usual and greenhouse gas production as usual. And you can see the CO2 keeps growing. On the other hand, RCP 4.5 has this thing taper off by about 2080. And the most aggressive RCP 2.6 has a reduction back down below 400 parts per million. So this is the prognosis of the driver for everything that's going on globally. The other figure I think that I should bring to your attention very soon is energy consumption. This is a, a figure generated annually by Livermore Labs. And you can see it refers to US energy consumption. Um, you can see in the pink, you can see the users. And on the left hand side, you can see the sources. Um, I, I should say from a personal perspective, you probably start thinking transportation and 
energy for transportation. And of course, we know that electric cars are coming along. So we, we can visualize some changes in energy uses for transportation. Um, but the biggest change in this figure over the last 15 years is in electricity generation. In fact, the US has reduced the amount of greenhouse gas produced in electricity generation uh, by about 27% over the last 15 years. And that relates to the sources used, the energy sources used. As geological and geotechnical engineers, we're very much involved in this map. Um, in fact, we're very heavily connected to the production of fossil fuels, petroleum, coal, natural gas. We also have a long-standing connection to hydropower and pump storage, a unique connection to geothermal energy, and of growing interest in wind energy. So we're very well connected in all these different sources. If you were to ask what is the one thing that's really changed in this chart over the last 15 years, it would be the transition from coal to natural gas for electricity production. And that's really been enabled by hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling. So I could argue that the work of geological and geotechnical engineers has been the largest single shift so far in this picture. Of course, shifting to natural gas doesn't wean us off fossil fuels. It's really a sort of transitional stage. And it points out that getting from uh, reducing greenhouse gases across this chart is a multifaceted approach. And there are many sort of side paths on the way. It's not a simple process. One has to conceive of doing a great many things. The other thing that's improved electricity generation of, um, reductions is the advance of solar and wind. And geotechnical engineers in particular have been very involved in wind energy. If you look at uh, electricity power generation across the US, you'll realize it's very regionally dependent. So what you see of electricity production depends on which part of the country you live in. For example, in the Northeast, we have seen very clearly the switch to natural gas from coal, whereas in the South, the North Rockies and the upper Midwest, the presence of wind energy becomes very obvious. If you look in the bars here, the little blue bar refers to the cost in cents per kilowatt hour. You'll realize why wind energy in those regions is being adopted very rapidly because it's costing less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. On the uh, northwest, of course, there's hydropower and so on. So the perspective on power generation depends very much where you live and how you see this transition. Geotechnical engineers have been very, very engaged in offshore wind power. And the primary focus of this has been in the North Sea. If you look today in the North Sea, there is something like 27 gigawatts of installed offshore wind power. It's nearly all in shallow waters under about 30 meters depth and involves uh, fixed bottom platforms founded on monopiles. The cost, the component cost, the capital cost, the substructure represents almost 30% of all the costs of offshore wind farms. And therefore the foundation engineering plays a very big role in the development and the reduction of cost of offshore wind power. In the North Sea, the costs for offshore wind power are around six cents a kilowatt hour. So already very competitive across the grid. Um, as we move forward in time, these offshore wind turbines are becoming enormous. This is the latest from IEA and it's a 15 megawatt turbine. It's got a rotor radius of 120 meters. That's almost 400 feet. So these are absolutely enormous structures. And as we install these enormous structures in deeper and deeper waters, ironically, we're gonna leverage more and more of the knowledge from the offshore oil and gas industry. So for example, in the figure on the bottom left, you can see a large offshore wind turbine subject to loads, and I'm showing it on a bucket foundation or a suction caisson, which is probably the most efficient type of foundation that might be used offshore in the US, at least in the short term, in terms of supporting the loads. As we go into deeper waters, we're gonna need floating structures and anchorages are gonna follow very much from the oil and gas industry. You may ask why North Sea first? The North Sea first is because the whole area around the North Sea has a very large population density. We're talking about 160 million people living in that MAPO area. And as a result, um, offshore wind can serve a large population. But of course, wind energy is intermittent and therefore power storage becomes very critical. And the other very important element that's made the North Sea successful is the potential to interconnect through high voltage direct current lines, interconnect the grids of the different countries. This enables the UK to be connected to Norway. 
And there is an enormous storage potential in Norway with unmet pump storage for hydropower. So the North Sea has some natural advantages which have really made it the place for offshore wind. If you turn to the US and you say what's happening, this is a, a map showing average wind speed at 80 meter height, and you'll realize the middle of the country has enormous onshore wind capacity. In fact, we've got more than 100 gigawatts installed in the US at the moment onshore, and about half of it in Kansas, Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. And you can see that band at the middle of the country. But it's relatively far from the big population centers. So offshore wind on the East Coast has also got enormous potential from the wind seat speed, as you can see, and has somewhat deeper water depths. The story so far is a little disappointing because although there are huge projections on offshore wind projects and lease areas, you can see from the bottom diagram on the right that we're vastly under fulfilling our expectations. So we should have already installed almost the same amount of power as in the North Sea, and we're perhaps four or five years adrift in this. So the story is not always simple, but I can see how geotechnical engineers are going to lead this development in a very big way. Another very interesting area where geotechnical and geological engineers have played a role is what people euphemistically call shallow geothermal. Shallow geothermal is a very strange term. The figure on the left shows how the ground temperature varies in the course of a given year. And you'll see a cone such that below about 10 meters and certainly below about 15 meters depth in the ground, the temperature remains constant year round. And in fact, if you go deeper and deeper in the crust, there is a small thermal gradient. We can use the fact that the temperature in the ground is characteristically somewhere between 10 and 15 Celsius to help us with building, heating, and cooling. Ground source heat pumps were first developed in the 1940s in the US um, and became a very big uh, target of opportunity from the 1970s onwards. Ground source heat pumps are essentially doing heating and cooling of buildings and they can discharge excess heat um, into the ground so in the summer months, while we're kill, cooling a building, we can discharge and store excess heat in the ground. And in winter, when we are trying to heat buildings, we can draw the heat back out of the ground. So we can manage seasonal heat storage uh, through shallow geothermal. So what's really changed in the last 15 years? Well, obviously, we would like to move from ground source heat pumps, which are very efficient, being used in residences into big industrial and commercial developments. And geotechnical engineers have sort of seized the moment here, and they've blended heat exchanger elements into the foundation elements. And people talk about energy piles or um, underneath buildings or heat exchangers in piles. I must say this is a fairly bold move because you're now combining structural function and heat exchange. Um, but the development has been very successful and works very well in many northern hemisphere areas where the seasonal heat exchange is going to be important. It's also been interesting to see how heat exchangers have found their way into other buried infrastructure, for example, in tunnel linings. There are several examples of projects which are now exchanging heat with a tunnel or subway station in the surrounding soil. There are also all kinds of sustainability possibilities here. Uh, I've been fascinated in parts of Europe where old mine workings and old shafts are being used for heat exchange by storing fluid in, in the mines and using the constant enthalpy of the fluid in the underground space. So there are many possibilities in this space. But geothermal generally means something bigger. It generally means something about the heat production inside the crust of the earth and the radioactive decay in igneous rocks in particular. You have to go much deeper in the ground to see real geothermal possibilities. The figure here shows us going down to perhaps eight kilometers. Most of you are aware that we get power from geothermal or hydrothermal plants, which produce essentially steam because of the very high temperature of the fluid. But the potential here for enhanced geothermal systems is really enormous because what it requires effectively is to find a depth in the ground where you have sufficient temperature to create a network of fractures and then essentially to use a carrier fluid to be able to transfer heat from one place to the injection point to the rejection point. Now, what's fascinating about this is that the field hasn't moved very far. And the question is, with such enormous potential, why? And it seems to me that enhanced geothermal may be on the way in in a big way, because the binary power plants that can be used to generate electricity 
really only require fluid temperatures a little above 100 Celsius these days to be able to produce electricity as opposed to heat and cooling. So where do we stand on this? Well, the maps at the top show you the maps of rock temperatures at two different depths. And you can see almost universally across the US, we have rocks certainly at six and a half kilometers with more than adequate temperatures. So we could be obtaining power from hot dry rocks through EGS systems. The beauty of this technology is it provides baseload electric power and therefore can replace many of the fossil fuel plants that are still in operation. It's almost universally available. The downsides to this, I personally am not sure that we've got any, we don't know. People ask questions about induced seismicity, but I've yet to see something which suggests significant problems. So it seems to me that enhanced geothermal may be back on the way in. Now, of course, this doesn't get us all the way to decarbonizing the economy. You will appreciate that to get from here to there is an enormous challenge. This figure shows greenhouse gas emissions in the equivalent gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. It's helpful to have in mind that we produce about 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide or equivalent per year at the moment. Trying to drive this down to zero is an enormous challenge. You can see in the red line, the projection which tries to do that in a time frame so that we keep changes in global temperatures less than two degrees Celsius. And it says we have to reach a condition of zero greenhouse gas emissions by about 2090. Now, if you look at the individual government commitments, you'd say, fine, we're in good shape. Many governments have committed to getting down there by about 2050 to 2060, but they're already behind in their projections and certain parts of the economy are gonna be very hard to decarbonize. So we're gonna need negative CO2 emissions. We're gonna to need to get to a condition where we can store CO2. And again, geological and geotechnical engineering comes to the rescue. There are two very, very important areas, geological sequestration of the gases and mineralization in situ under the ground. There's another area which is talked about very widely, which is afforestation. But as anyone who's lived through the, 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 the forest fires in California knows, storing carbon in trees is only so good. If they burn, you simply produce more carbon into the atmosphere. So actually finding ways to afforest and store carbon is a challenge. Geologically, we're already on track to do something about this. Geological sequestration offers many solutions to the way you could store CO2 in the ground. Normally we're stalling supercritical CO2 and there are a number of prototype projects which are in the black dots on the figure on the right. Um, typically those projects have been running at about a megaton of carbon dioxide a year, sometimes up to about three or four. So to scale this up to the scale where it's significant for the global climate, we are talking about scaling a factor of a thousand, a thousand of those projects. We could store in depleted oil and gas reservoirs. The beauty about this is those reservoirs are very well characterized. Um, in, in other words, they have cap rocks and so on. But in fact, the injection rate uh, needs to be limited so you don't build up pressures that would cause fracturing of cap rocks. So that might be a, an issue of a big concern. There's another advantage for oil and gas, you get further enhanced recovery of oil when you do this. There's much larger potential, it turns out, certainly in the US, in deep saline aquifers, maybe a factor of 10 more potential. Here, the challenge is the reservoirs are just not that well characterized and trying to understand leakage from them becomes a really big issue. There are other intriguing possibilities. Um, coal bed methane can be extracted by replacing with CO2, for example. That, of course, doesn't wean us off the fossil fuels, but it, it does achieve some amount of storage of greenhouse gas. The one I found fascinating is the emergence of um, in situ mineralization. If you mix um, the carbon dioxides with the right reactants in porous basalt, which is a, a basic igneous rock, you can bring about in situ mineralization in the order of months to years. And there have been a number of experiments, notably in Iceland, that have successfully done this. Porous basalts exist all over the world. And there are places where this is going to sound like a really good solution. If I were worrying about coal emissions in India, I would look very closely at the porous basalts. So we have ways forward and geological and geotechnical engineering contribute to this big mitigation problem. I'd like to switch to adaptation. 
Adaptation is tricky. It involves many different factors. The one that most people think of initially is mean sea level rise. This figure starts us off in this topic by just showing how mean sea level rise has been recorded historically and what the future projections look like. You will see that we have had rather exquisite data for about 25 years from satellites. And before that, we relied on tide gauges and geological inference. The future projections, of course, depend on the RCP pathways. What you can see in this figure, um, current rates of sea level rise are up to about 10 millimeters a year, as we, as we will see. But you can see there's a very wide range of projected sea level rise by 2100. Um, the big factors here are the deep uncertainties about tipping points in the global climate system. For example, most notably, if West Antarctic ice shelf, shelf breaks apart, we could gain up to about 2.4 meters of sea level rise by 2100. But most projections show that not happening at RCP 4.5. And you can see that most people are conceiving that sea level rise could be in the range one to one and a half meters by the end of this century, so within the time range of planning. You may be less aware of the fact that sea level rise is very regional. The prediction of sea level rise is extraordinarily difficult because of all the different sources of water coming into the oceans and the fact that it's very contingent on the temperature of the water that you're mixing with. So we've got to know more about the temperatures in the deep oceans. What this figure shows is the regional variation and it shows you roughly the scale of activity. It shows us that sea level trends at the moment are generally bounded between plus and minus 10 millimeters a year, plus being the sea level rise and minus the, the, the lowering of the sea level. So this is the sort of state of play as interpreted over a 25 year period from satellites. As geological and geotechnical engineers, we kind of know there's something else everyone's missing, which is the issue of erosion and subsidence. If you live in Southern Louisiana, you're very conscious of erosion, coastal erosion shown in this picture in red over a 70 year period in the second part of the 20th century, you can see has eroded a huge part of coastal Louisiana. And the question is why is erosion so high in these areas? Some of it is simply due to the subsidence. And this is a map of subsidence over a three year period um, for the greater New Orleans area. And the scale is a little annoying, but you'll be able to read it, I think. And you can see that there are parts of this area which are subsiding in the order of 10 to 20 millimeters a year, something like that. In other words, rather comparable to the rates of global sea level rise by the end of, the, of this century. So we don't know the causes of this in New Orleans, but we know it must be a large factor affecting the, the coastal erosion. Of course, this is nothing compared to some parts of the world. Anthropic subsidence is a huge issue. You can see anthropic subsidence for a series of cities in Asia going all the way back to 1900. And of course, this reflects water resources that civil engineers know about and the use or excessive use of groundwater pumping underneath these cities. You can see how Tokyo uh, stopped or solved its problem around 1970 after 70 years of groundwater pumping producing four and a half meters of subsidence. And then you look forward and you can see that Jakarta is the champion today. Jakarta is subsiding, according to this INSAR data, somewhere between 10 and 20 centimeters a year in order, order of magnitude larger than sea level rise. So there are parts of the world where industrialization or urbanization and groundwater pumping are far more important than sea level rise from climate change per se. So these are issues that somebody can do something about and the geological and geotechnical engineers are heavily engaged in. When people think about adaptation, however, they think mainly hazards. This is my favorite map in all the years I've worked, I think. It brings together two of the biggest hazards we can think of, earthquakes, which the community knows a lot about, and tropical cyclones, which are cyclonic storms originating in the equatorial regions. And you can see the paths of these in green. At first sight, um, you can appreciate how this is very important in the US for the Gulf Coast and the East Coast, where a large population is exposed to these storms. This doesn't tell, of course, the full story of climate change. I'm sure folks in Iowa are not relieved to know that there are storms affecting the East Coast 
They've just had one of the largest windstorms in history, the Direct Show, which did more than $7 billion worth of damage. So it really is only a partial picture. Those of us in Boston also suffer from nor'easters, which are extra tropical storms. So they don't fit into this picture. But I think you get the idea that these big tropical storms are a very large part of the hazard we face with climate change. In fact, if you look at the damage costs for natural hazards, the light blue ones there are ones which are essentially from these big storms, these big coastal storms. And they're the single most expensive hazard out there other than the occasional very large earthquake. The damage here is caused primarily by flooding and flooding relates to two separate things. Flooding relates to the storm surge principally um, caused by the persistence and extent of the wind field that we have with these storms and by extreme precipitation, which reflects very much the amount of moisture in the storm and the, and the rate of advance of the storm, the movement of the eye of the storm. Perhaps the most convincing piece of data linking storms and climate change is this piece from my MIT colleague, Kerry Emanuel. What it shows in blue is the sea surface temperature in the mid-Atlantic where these storms develop, these tropical storms develop. And in red, it shows you the maximum storm intensity. And hopefully you can appreciate the very close correlation of these two pieces of data over at least the last 50 years. That correlation is a great deal higher than R squared equals 0.58. It's something in the order of 0.8. So we know that storm intensity is growing with sea surface temperature, which is related to climate change. So we can expect with climate change much more intense storms. And there's also increasing evidence of increasing frequency in addition to sea level rise. So how does this affect us? Well, in terms of storm surge, we've grown a little complacent because our colleagues in hydrodynamics are rather good at predicting storm surge. What you're seeing in this figure is an advanced prediction of the storm surge probabilities for Hurricane Sandy about a day before the storm made landfall. And you can see there's a 50% probability of a surge greater than two meters. In fact, a day later, the storm surge was 4.3 meters and drowned lower Manhattan. Storm intensification is something we still haven't got to grips with. Some of the recent storms have generated much more intense storm activity in a very short space of time, and that remains a big challenge. Sometimes storms linger and generate enormous amounts of precipitation as Hurricane Harvey did in Houston. Here are the challenges, we're simply overloading aging stormwater infrastructure, which needs to be upgraded in some way. Houston also peculiarly suffers from a lack of zoning in its urbanization. And of course, the urbanization itself has limited the infiltration capacity. So Houston is particularly vulnerable to stormwater problems like this. If you look forward and you say, well, what are we gonna do for coastal adaptation and how our geotechnical engineers gonna fit into this? The most important thing to understand is we need solutions that address both of these things. And the most challenging thing for storm adaptation is that our current re regulations actually decouple these two elements. In other words, the Corps of Engineers deals with storm surge, local cities deal with stormwater management. This is a huge challenge for coastal adaptation. Until we address this, a lot of other things won't work. What do we mean usually when we think about coastal adaptation? We think about a myriad of different defenses that can put us between the ocean and protect our houses and property. If you look at these from the right to the left, you'll realize we already spend lots of money every year on beach restoration, primarily for recreational purposes, but we get storm protection benefits. And as you move towards the coast, you see that there are many nature-based features. These could involve mangrove forests, this could involve wetlands, tidal marshes, and so on, all of which can attenuate some of the storm action. Geotechnical engineers tend to be in the gray infrastructure world of levees, and flood walls, um, but really the protection that we provide for the coast is a function of combining these gray and green infrastructures. And this is again a challenge for us to come up with integrated ways to do business. Whereas we have some understanding of the performance of walls and levees, quantifying the effectiveness of the nature-based features, the green infrastructure is still a challenge, although they're often very cost-effective. That relates to protection. Another strategy for coastal adaptation says we elevate structures or we improve storm water. Those are accommodations, if you like, 
that says that we can flood without being damaged or experiencing um, um, un unacceptable damage. There are other strategies too. You can think about advance. Many cities of the world have grown through land reclamation. I love to tell my MIT colleagues that our campus is built on reclaimed land just a little over 100 years ago. So land reclamation, which is very much a geotechnical topic, can play a big role here also. Finally, there are going to be communities that are going to have to retreat, and retreat is going to present very large socio-economical stresses. What about urban stormwater management, the other side of this story? This is a figure sort of showing the overall hydrology of cities versus green landscapes. And the message should be clear, which is you have large rainfall from big storm events, extreme precipitation events. In a natural environment, a certain fraction of that water infiltrates into the subsurface and a much smaller fraction runs off, maybe 10%. In an urbanized setting, evaporation may look rather similar, but because of urbanization, there's very little infiltration and there's much larger runoff. So our stormwater infrastructure has always been a very big challenge for us with or without climate change. We think in big cities in the East Coast of combined sewer outfalls, which dump a lot of contaminated water in big storm events. The granddaddy of all gray infrastructure for stormwater is in Tokyo, where they've built a flood tunnel, a, a simply massive underground storage facility to store flood waters for storm infiltration. This is an extremely expensive proposition that reflects the fact that Tokyo is such a large population. Many cities are looking at how to improve the soaking up of rain through green infrastructure. So green infrastructures offer a, a much more attractive proposition if we can increase infiltration very significantly. And these can range from green roofs to bioswales to porous pavements. There's a whole slew of different activities that go into the green infrastructures. And I would suggest in stormwater management, there's been a shift away from capital intensive gray infrastructures although I must say in some cases there's new renewal is needed, but there's a shift towards these green infrastructures. And obviously the challenge is to try and show how well they work. And if Trish Culligan were here giving this talk, she would tell you a lot about the experience they've had quantifying infiltration in New York City. So let's turn to the damage itself. We already have experienced huge damage from tropical storms. Hurricane Sandy knocked out the transportation networks and all the tunnels of Lower Manhattan. It costs more than $70 billion in damage, about 25 to 30% associated with the infrastructure. Tunnel repairs are still in progress. Salt water and transit tunnels don't mix very well. So what are our options in New York and how does climate change affect things? Well, if you project forward and you say, what's gonna to happen to New York by 2100? You can anticipate the order of a meter plus or minus half a meter of sea level rise, depending on the RCP. The storm surge intensity suggests we could have surges, which are also perhaps a meter plus or minus 0.2 meters higher than present. You can add those two effects and you will realize that, of course, the return period of 100 years that we might design for will become a return period of one in 20 years by 2100. So this is a real challenge for us trying to figure out what is the appropriate way to design this type of infrastructure. The Corps of Engineers is already out designing systems for New York and proposing options. I picked just one of a smorgasbord of suggestions they had. This was one of their solutions 3A, which involves four barriers protecting the areas you can see in the colored map. The figure shows the projected storm surge barrier for uh, Verrazzano Narrows. Um, you can see this has got an estimated 20 year construction time frame and a, a initial cost estimate of about $34 billion. So we're talking from fairly serious money here. Soon we're gonna talk a lot of money. Uh, this is a big challenge to decide what are the environmental consequences of this? Do we need this? Is, the, is this the appropriate strategy for a city like New York? How do we handle the uncertainties for the climate change predictions? And how do we reduce risk and maintain flexibility in design? This is a huge challenge for us right now. And it's not just affecting New York, it's affecting cities up and down the East Coast and the Gulf Coast of the US in particular. At this point, it's probably nice to sort of take a breath and, and revel in something which is successful at last. Venice 
has dealt with flooding and resilience for more than 50 years and has been flooded on a regular basis by Aqua Alta events. 1966 was the high water point. It's referred to as the Aqua Grande. 1.96 meters of storm surge did huge damage to the city. Um, and here we are, November 12th, 2019, a storm of almost comparable magnitude, more than 50 years later, did about a billion dollars worth of damage to the city. Venice, of course, sits as an island within a lagoon. The lagoon is a man-made environment. Protecting and preserving this environment, making sure that it remains a shallow lagoon is critical to the environmental health of Venice. So you need wetlands and mud flats and salt marshes and so on. So devising a solution that works both for the city and for the lagoon is rather critical. There are three main openings to the lagoon through which seawater passes flushing the lagoon on a daily basis, twice daily basis. If you look at what happened to Venice, 1973 it was declared a priority of national interest, something needed to be done for flood coastal adaptation. Um, they designed mobile barriers for these gates by 94. The environmental impacts, the integration of all these schemes for Venice was agreed by about 1998, but it's taken more than 20 years to construct thanks to financing issues. Why do I bring this to your attention? Well, I think it's a triumph and it's a triumph of engineering in particular geotechnical engineering. The Moser flood barriers came up with a completely unique design you can see it's a buoyant flapping floodgate. It's a hollow steel box, which sits on the seabed and is raised by injecting air. So it's a buoyant system. You can see that each of the barriers involves multiple gates and each of the gates flaps independently. The gates are in any cases up to more than 60 foot high. Um, they have to operate under conditions with projected sea level rise to handle perhaps another meter of sea level rise or land water. They lie on the seabed, they're completely non-intrusive, they don't affect the function of the lagoon by and large, and the rise time is about 30 minutes. The geotechnical engineering is the most critical element because you've got to control the displacements between these two adjacent gates. I should actually step back and say the hinge is the most important element, but the, the foundation is extremely important. And I report it to you because the first time this gate was being used in a storm was in October this year. It's now been used and kept Venice dry through four storms. Extreme rainfall doesn't just happen on coastal cities. It happens, of course, very prominently in mountainous terrains. The, the, the world record ho holder at the moment, I think, is Typhoon Morocot hitting Taiwan and dumping almost three meters of rain, causing endless landslides. And one of the things I was curious about was what do we project will happen to landslide risks? with climate change. There have been a couple of studies. I picked this one from Gariano. And the really only thing to notice here is that by and large, we expect landslide hazards to increase over time. And despite all the concern, the bottom line is more extreme precipitation events, more landslides. So I don't think there's a profound study here, but it probably tells us that as geological and geotechnical engineers, we're gonna be in business for a long time dealing with extreme precipitation events. But precipitation, we have to think not just of extreme events, we have to think about the distribution and how it's spread across the globe annually. How is mean precipitation going to change? This figure shows the projections under um, 1.5 and 2 degree warming with stabilization conditions. And you'll see in the, in the red colors, you will see drought or, or reductions in amount of rainfall and in blue increases in rainfall. And you can see this is a very regional pattern of, of rainfall shift. And the question is, how is this going to affect us? As a geotechnical engineer, I, I, I think it's important to appreciate that we deal with many things at the ground surface, earth structures, and the interaction of earth structures in the atmosphere is going to become increasingly important as we deal with longer periods of drought cycles and the like. And in fact, this figure, which I borrowed from Phil Varden, is a very nice figure illustrating some of the things for a sort of notional earth structure. I would also point you to two wonderful ranking lectures on this topic, one by Jeff Blight in 97 and one by Antonio Jens in 2010. They deal with all the technologies, all of the partially saturated soils, all of the multi-phase behavior, all of the complexities that go on into this problem. 
But I, what I would suggest to you from a climate change perspective is what we're really asking is, how will these earth structures perform in extreme droughts? What are the desiccation effects? Can we minimize those effects? Can we improve erosion resistance and durability through stabilization of fills? And there's lots of work going on in stabilization at the moment. And further, what do we do and what do we know about the interactions with vegetation? How can we make vegetations work with our earth structures in constructive ways? So there's lots of scope for us at this scale. But at a larger scale, changes in precipitation must affect water supply. And groundwater is our domain too. Groundwater depletion is a huge problem and a huge challenge, predating much climate change. This shows the, the depletion rates of reservoirs across the US. And in fact, if you took the world picture, about a one third of world's aquifers are under stress. In the US, we get 38% of our drinking water from groundwater, and we get more than 40% of our irrigation water from groundwater. So these stresses matter to us hugely in terms of long-term predictions. And you'll see the, um, some of these in some of the future figures that I'm about to show. I've also been fascinated by how we can combine data to understand groundwater resources. You've seen already subsidence information from INSAR. This is the interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar data. This is enabling us to map changes in ground surface height over time. These are data from the Sentinel satellite in the period 2015 to 2017, looking at the Central Valley or San Joaquin Valley in California. And you can see how the drought cycle in this period has brought about a, re a reduction in ground level due to the drawdown in the aquifer. But of course, this is just a surface realization. The really interesting piece coming out of remote sensing data now is the ability to start looking below the ground. And there's a recent study on the same aquifer by OJA, which uses the GRACE satellite, which looks at gravity measurements and looks at gravimetric changes in the subsurface and tries to correlate that with the subsidence. And I think more and more data are going to come from these things, which will help us understand and measure how, how aquifers are behaving. In this case, they compared with ground truth data from wells at various sites. So that's sort of where the story is today. So what is the future predictor, prediction from climate changes on groundwater? Well, the same picture that you see at the top looks very much what I showed you for soil atmosphere interactions. You can see that we're interested in how changes in rainfall or snow melt relate to infiltration and recharge, relate to surface evaporation and transpiration changes. And we have to put this in the projection of what happens in a future climate. So the question is, how does groundwater storage change if the climate changes according to those different RCP pathways? This is a study which is just starting to get into shape because it requires multi scales of modeling of these things at the global scale. But the paper by Wu is very interesting. It shows how climate change links to the performance of certain key aquifers. And you'll see in this figure seven aquifers, the, um, they're distributed all around the world. And you'll see in the bottom plots, the expected time change of aquifer storage for the RCP 8.5 scenario. In other words, business as usual. And it's kind of interesting because when you combine all this information, you realize that the rainfall isn't really all the driver here. It's very much related to evapotranspiration. And the picture varies depending on which part of the world you're in. There are winners and losers in aquifers. You will see the central valley is relatively stable whereas the southern plains, the southern part of the Ogallala aquifer goes down. There are huge problems in the Middle East, but there are winners. You see Northwestern India, this is the Ganges aquifer, is actually likely to be recharged at a higher rate. So in groundwater resources and availability of water, these shifts are gonna have very big changes in where water resource has to come from. And geotechnical engineers are certainly gonna be involved in figuring out how to supply that water. Oh, Andrew, we need to kind of yep, wrap. I just, I just, three more slides. Great. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to say something about climate change in the Arctic. Um, when you look at the Arctic regions, you're aware that they're underlain primarily by permafrost, permanently frozen ground. Of course, the Arctic is warming at twice the global mean. It's relatively sparsely populated. We know a lot about sea ice reductions. 
And you realize this is an area where there's going to be increased economic activity in future. Hazards due to thawing permafrost, subsidence, landsliding, huge damage to infrastructures. And I'm reminded of the fact that we've known about these problems since the construction of the Alaska pipeline. So we're aware of trying to stabilize infrastructure on these situations. Nice study which has just appeared looks at how all of the infrastructures are affected in climate change by the middle of the century. And you'll realize almost every infrastructure component in the Arctic region is going to be affected by the thawing effects and going to require reconstruction. So this is a huge challenge for us. And to round this thing all the way back to where I started, of course, permafrost is a huge store of greenhouse gases, of carbon in the ground. And as anthropogenic warming occurs and we thaw permafrost, we have a potential carbon feedback into the atmosphere. And so I would throw out the last challenge and perhaps the biggest one to you as a community. How do we stabilize this process? How do we prevent a lot of negative feedback coming from melting permafrost? I think that's a real challenge. Fortunately, it's not immediately on our plate, but it will be by the end of this century. And with that, and Alan's reminder, I'd just like to thank you all very much for your attention and leave you to unleash your natural curiosity about all these things. Thank you very much. Well, Andrew, that was just great. It's a rather you know, big, broad view, but a lot of specifics in there for us as geotechnical engineers. You know, I remind you, you got a last chance here to submit a question if you'd like. Uh, we're trying to uh, queue those up. Um, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Pedro is going to help us uh, uh, with those. Um, let's see here, just make sure. I think that's all I need to do right now, except just again, it was a great lecture, Andrew, and we really appreciate it. So uh, Pedro, you want to take over now and uh, give us some challenging questions? Uh, Andrew, thank you very much for the presentation. It was, it was really, really, really good. So uh, we have been collecting some questions here. So I will ask you some of them and let's see how far we can go. Some of them are easy. Some, let's start with the simple <laughs> we'll ones. Start with, start with the easy ones, huh? Yeah, so uh, you were talking about in some of your slides about rejected energy. What is rejected uh, energy? You have oh. that in the chart of oh. energy use. Oh, uh, rejected, rejected energy. When, when, when we use air conditioners in the summer, we cool down the inside of our buildings, we're rejecting heat. So we're heating up the outside environment. So that is rejected heat into the environment. In fact, that causes another feedback into urban situations where you get urban heat island effects. So being able to take that rejected heat and put it into the ground, putting it somewhere where it doesn't actually cause distress for people walking around city streets. That's the use of rejected heat, for, for example. So here there is what I will try to combine two here. And one says that uh, extreme events pattern in a climate change is noticeable. How do we approach or adapt our geotechnical designs for these hundred year storm events? And what I wanna add to that is the timing because you were showing uh, the hazard of a storm and an earthquake, but they don't happen at the same time. And how do we adapt to this? And Adding to add, what is the role of modern geotechnical monitoring in the, in the face of all these things? Monitoring, of course, is key to all of these things. Monitoring is about understanding climate change as well, as well as understanding the performance of our structures. So monitoring is key to all of this. Um, so I didn't sort of try and frame it that way. But the question you ask is the tricky one, which is, you know, how do you, how do you design things with big uncertainties about your design parameters? Because you have to pick, um, you know, in designs, you have to start with some notion, for example, of extreme sea levels that you're going to design to. Um, so it, it does set the parameters for design. I'm not sure what, you know, I, you've many, many parts of that question. You said modern geotechnical engineering. I mean, geotechnical engineering is, is adapting all the time. So designing things with better erosion resistance using you know, materials more effectively. There's, there's many versions of that. So I'm not quite sure how I answer you. It's a little, try, try again, try again, see if you can point um, in the right direction. Yeah, so um, the thing is for me in the question, what, they are, what this person is trying to ask is, um, how do you adapt? So we, we have codes, we have design approaches, 
should we be changing all these codes that we have already in place uh, or, or not? Um, um, well, you, if we're designing new things, we, old codes aren't going to work necessarily. So, so they are going to require adaptation. I would like to think the codes are also adapting as they move forward, but I'm not closely involved in code development. Do you see progress in this? Do you see progress in this? Or you don't I, I, see progress? I, I, I see the, the problem I see is not, I mean, I don't necessarily see it from a geotechnical perspective, but I see we're reactive very often. For example, in, in recent coastal storms, there's been a recognition that a lot of power infrastructure in the basements of buildings makes them very vulnerable. And yet the design regulations on buildings require them to be put in basements. So power plants for hospitals are particularly vulnerable so after Hurricane Sandy, a lot of regulations change. So regulations change. Do design codes change? I would hope design codes preserve safety, of course. Um, but then they change over, over a longer timeline, perhaps. Um, but the question with climate change is how quickly are we having to respond to these things? And what is a reasonable projection? Um, most infrastructure is designed with a 50-year, notional 50-year window but there's an awful lot of infrastructure we're using, which is 100, 150 years old. So um, it is a challenge for us, I have to confess. The, uh, here there was a question, it's, it's, I think is also kind of a specific. Uh, do you see um, the repurposing of oil and gas wells for geotechnical develop, uh, geothermal uh, developments? Could they be used for geothermal? Because they, you know, they are in the ground. They are... Yes, they are, but they're not terribly helpful because they're, they're not necessarily in the rocks with the right kind of temperature. It, the, the places you're most interested in for geothermal, um, you're most interested where the temperature is high enough for the shortest drilling distance. You're probably looking at igneous rocks and fracturing of igneous rocks rather than, than sandstones and the like, which would be the, the, the characteristic. I'm not saying that sedimentary rocks can't possibly occur. I'm just saying igneous rocks tend to be those with higher temperatures. Um, so it, it is a somewhat different scenario, I would say, for the hot, dry rocks, yeah. Um, okay, uh, here, another one. How does reclaimed land impact sea level rise? Countries like China and Japan plan to generate a new land by filling reclaimed land for urban development. Are there studies on this impact on what to do with reclaimed land that you are uh, aware of? Um, yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm aware that people have looked, for, I mean, there's a lot of land reclamation around Shanghai, and I'm aware that people are doing a lot of geotechnical analyses on the subsidence of the reclaimed land and how, how much subsidence is going to occur relative to sea level rise. Um, so there's a lot of concern of that kind. Um, but by and large, our capacity to extend our waterfront outwards exceeds the challenge of the, the slow moving sea level rise. So I've worked a lot in Singapore over the last few years and the, the whole country has decided or decreed that it will have a coastline which is higher than it currently has. So you know you can conceive of doing this. Of course many countries have put land reclamation as a way of handling their position. The Netherlands of course famously puts a lot of barriers between the sea and the cities. Um, so there's plenty of examples of land reclamation operating perfectly successfully, but, but the geotechnical side of this is finding cost-effective ways to do it and making realistic predictions of how, how things perform. So. Andrew, I took the question a little differently that maybe they're asking if the volume taken up by land reclamation affects sea level rise. Yeah. I don't think there's any, this is uh, not, 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 I suppose there's possible scenarios locally, but, um, uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. The volumes are tiny, really, relative yeah, to the I, 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 I missed that, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here, uh, uh, why did you choose the uh, greenhouse emissions pathway figure with the net zero needed to be achieved in 2090 to meet a two uh, degrees Celsius goal? And here the question is, I think most IPCC projections are much earlier, like, or the 2060 or earlier? Why did you choose the 29? Uh, oh, the, the figure I showed there, what I showed was the t two degrees stabilization line. So that was a line if you stabilize at two degrees C. 
by 2090. No, I agree. There's people trying to achieve stabilization at lower, low, lower global temperature changes sooner. Um, th this is a bit of a moving target because um, the targets set by governments are generally being underachieved and there's generally more and more dire warnings being produced. But I just want to point out, this is a trajectory we're going on, but decarbonizing doesn't end with, you know, we're not going to decarbonize the whole economy just like that. So my point was really to recognize the fact that there's going to need to be more storage of greenhouse gases. And that was really what I was trying to point out. One final question, because I think that we are reaching the time. And after that, we may see what we do. But okay. in a lot of what we are talking, uncertainty is, is seems to be a, an important aspect to consider. So the question was, how can we address climate change uncertainties in geotechnical analysis and design? Yeah, I'd hate to over overemphasize the uncertainties in the time frame of the next 60 to 80 years, um, providing we are following the sort of mitigation pathways we're on, the RCP 4.5 line, for example, may well get adopted as a, a, a practical design. That doesn't answer questions about how climate change may project going forward over hundreds of years. But so I don't think we're, it's that uncertain, Pedro. I think we're not we're not living with, um, well, with the, the things that would make it a lot more uncertain are very big drivers, like the West Antarctic ice shelf, for example, is, is certainly an uncertainty. But it, it's not in our immediate 10 to 20 year horizon. It's probably not in our horizon for designs that are going on today. But it, it, it could well be if we don't follow or don't achieve some control over greenhouse gas, it could become a big problem for us. So it's sort of a warning out there. It's a lurking warning. Okay, I think that we have reached uh, the time here. So first of all, from my perspective, thank you very much. There are several other questions here that you may want to look and maybe find a way to respond them, maybe extra time or in another format. I will pass now the, and, and the control to, to Alan for your last words. Yes, thank you, Professor Arduino. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Whittle. Uh, that was really extraordinary and fascinating. And I, I think what it showed is there's a huge future for geotechnical engineers that want to dive into these uh, any one of these many subject areas and challenge us right on those fringes of very important questions to society. Um, I remind you that we will post this webinar online and that information will be sent out to each one of you. Um, uh, sometime in the next day or two as to where, where you will find that. There are over 400 of you that participated as I monitored this, um, still um, almost 300 of you still here, so indicating a high level of interest. So congratulations, Andrew, and drawing a great crowd. Uh, also, I have to again remind us a disclaimer that any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals and not the representing the National Academies in any way. And thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, it would be nice if we were all in one big room and could continue this discussion. I'm sure it would be lively and uh, go on for quite a while, but unfortunately we can't do that. Let's look forward to it in the near future. Thanks again, everybody, and all those who helped do this. And um, we look forward to the next webinar.